Now let's get going, folks, and we'll begin like we will every day here on Menzoid Mornings with something that's really grinding my gears. Time now for the Menzoid Monologue. Well, the Menzoid was moaning about the cost of filling up his Ford Adrenaline the other day, and a co-worker here at The Sun suggested I could reduce the cost of commuting by carpooling. Granted, at first blush, sharing a car and sharing the cost of filling the car's gas tank seems to make perfect sense, especially if all the occupants are headed in the same general direction. So what's the downside to communal commuting? Well, how about this? The complete eradication of one's much cherished personal space. One of the great things about driving is that an automobile is the ultimate freedom machine. A car excels as a bastion of sublime sanctuary. Segregated from others, you can recline the seat as far back as you want. You can play your favorite radio station at your preferred level of volume. Heck, you can even shamelessly and unapologetically belch or break wind if need be. But alone behind the wheel, you are indeed master of your own domain. But the driving dynamic radically alters when there are others in the vehicle. Years ago, I found myself temporarily carless and was thrust into a carpooling arrangement. How did I enjoy it, folks? Well, two words, never again. Indeed, even if the gas hits that mythical $2 a liter benchmark, your correspondent shall simply grin and bear it in his quest to fly solo. The reason? Well, consider the following passenger types who I encountered during that fateful year of carpooling. And keep in mind, these are the sorts of passengers you might encounter too if you truly believe that Barney saying sharing is caring when it comes to commuting. First of all, musical Mo. Well, Mo absolutely needed his music in the morning, and that music was always, always ghastly heavy metal tunes on his custom recorded cassette. It's the soundtrack of my life, man, Mo would say, without any hint of humor or irony. So it is that Mo, when allowed to get his way, would rock his head back and forth to the music as if he were a passenger in Garth's hideous AMC Pacer from Wayne's World. So sad, so sonically horrendous. Then there was inebriated Ian. The quintessential lush, you could practically smell the Sambuca on Ian's breath a kilometer away, much to our horror, about once a month. Ian would yell, pull over, stop the car. Oh yeah, we know what that meant. Sometimes Ian would make it out in time on other occasions. Well, <laughs> the old Honda soon resembled the vomit comet due to Ian's dishonorable discharge. And then there was Doris Downer. For dear Doris, oh, the glass was always half empty and no cloud ever had a silver lining, folks. She'd always find a dark side to every situation. Filling up at the local SO, Doris would drone on about the dangers of benzene in the gasoline. Buying some snacks on the go, Doris would recite the caloric and cholesterol content pertaining to every pastry and potato chip. Where is there an ejector seat when one needs one? And tardy Tina, oh, there was a winner, rolling up at Tina's place and honking the horn. Tina would invariably come to the door clad in her bathrobe, a telltale sign she had yet to shower. A five finger signal would convey she'd be ready in five minutes. Although we all knew it would be at least 20 minutes given her makeup requirements alone. So we'd do a slow burn waiting for Tina to get ready, knowing she'd profusely apologize for being late and promise that it would never happen again, even though we all knew we'd be subjected to the exact same routine the very next day because Tina seemed to have a problem programming a digital alarm clock. Then there was sleep deprived Sylvester. Oh lordy, you could always tell by his dopey mug and crease ravaged face that Sly had pulled yet another all nighter or he had watched a West Coast game. Whatever the case, Sylvester would almost always nod off and with his trip to dreamland would come eardrum shattering snoring, sometimes accompanied 
by a little river of drool meandering out the corner of his gaping mouth. And then there was Sporty Spencer. The conversation always began with his ripped off trademark phrase, hey, how about those Blue Jays? Then Spencer would transform himself into a walking, talking Elias Sports Bureau of completely useless, irrelevant, and mind-numbingly boring baseball trivia dating back to the days when the Dodgers and Giants were based in New York. And then there was hygiene challenged Hank. Hank was proof positive there are some people in our modern day world who just don't pay attention to all those ads promoting Old Spice, Colgate, Listerine, and myriad other personal hygiene products. However, Hank always seemed well versed in the merits of consuming raw garlic. Thus, with Hank in the car, it wasn't unusual to commute, commute sometimes with the windows rolled all the way down, even if the temperature was minus 20. Bottom line, I'd like to be environmentally friendly vis-a-vis -vis carpooling. I'd like to lower my gas bill. I really would. Alas, it's just that I have found that going green and accepting car socialism tends to make me mean, so it's a no-go. And that's the Menzoid Monologue.